we are looking at miscue analysis and eye movement research. Miscue analysis is a study of the types of miscues students make while reading orally. Now, a miscue is when what is on the page doesn't match with what students say while reading orally. We do not call it an error because these miscues often represent mature reading behavior, as you will see. Now, Paulson looked at two types of miscues. A substitution is when you put another word in there for the word that is actually there, and an omission, when you skip the word entirely. Now, I like to use two types of miscues. I like to describe them. I call them meaningful miscues when the word that you say makes sense within the sentence, when meaning is retained, even though it is a miscue. Instead of the dog ran down the road, the dog run down the road. Meaning is retained even though the word that it says doesn't match what's on the page. A significant miscue is when it does not make sense or meaning is not retained. The dog slept down the road. That's an example of a significant miscue. Now, expert readers often substitute. We often put in a word that makes sense within the sentence, a meaningful miscue, or we often put in a word that may not make sense, but it's grammatically correct. Why do we do this? The top-down flow of information. We are creating meaning with text. And sometimes we put in words that help us create meaning with text but may not match what's on the page. Get used to watching the eyeballs of your students as they read. They tell us a lot about how that student is processing the text as a teacher of reading. Now, saccades are the skips that the eyeballs make moving from one to the next. A fixation is when your eye stops on a word, and aggression is when your eyeballs go back when reading. When we read text, our eyes do not move in a straight line across the page. They make skips from word to word called saccades. They skip words, repeat words, and fixate on words. And here that little dot it represents a fixation where the eyeball stopped. And we'll look at how many words we stop. We don't fixate on every word. We don't stop on every word. We don't read word by word. We do not fixate on every letter. Eye movement studies show that 30 to 40% of the words are skipped. We don't fixate, and we can only perceive a word when we stop it, perceive it in the literal sense of the word. Our brain fills in the blanks. It fools us into thinking that we are perceiving every word. And uh, the length of the word didn't matter as far as skips go. We tend to skip more function words. These are words that serve only a grammatical function in their over and in. We skip fewer content words. These are words that carry semantic meaning. And again, this represents the uh, act of reading as a meaning-making process. We're trying to create meaning. So of course it makes sense that we'll focus on, fixate on more content words. The readers gain information from the perfovio as to word, what the word might be. And you can see this nice illustration. There's a fovio. These are the words that are in focus, and we're looking slightly ahead. This is paraphobia, that is blurry, but our brain is using this top-down function to predict what these words might be. The cortex is actually used to direct the eyes during the act of reading, where to fixate, what words to fixate on, and what part of the word. Rayner's 1996 study found that predictability of words affects fixation time. We skip more of the words that are predictable. That makes sense within the context of the sentence. We know what the next word might. You fill in the word be there, didn't you? That's predictable. We fixate more on less predictable words. 2000 study, I movement and miscue analysis, we, uh, Paulson, examined the words readers admitted or substitute. Now, the results showed that orally admitted words or substituted words are often fixated. That means our eyeballs stop right on the word, but we still often either omit it or substitute it. So get rid of this idea that we omit words related to not being able to see it somehow. We 
our eyeballs stop right on it. And again, this top-down process of creating meaning with print. Reading is not sounding out every word. We do not fixate on every word or every letter as we read. It's a top-down process as well as bottom-up. Most of the words that are not fixated on are read without miscues. Even though our eyeball doesn't stop, we read them just fine. This tells us that meaning is not transferred directly from the text to the reader, but it's a transaction between the text and the reader. And again, 10 times more information is flowing down than flowing up. The eye movement reflects a meaning-making process. The brain is looking at that, trying to make sense of this, to create meaning. As well, we do not fixate in a logical order. The numbers here illustrate the order in which the eyeball stopped. And if we read this in order, the polenta, the cornmeal, often, be it does not make sense. Our eyeballs go back sometimes to uh, regress. That's an example of regression. To check it out, to help our brain create meaning with print. Regression occurs 10 to 15% of the time. And again, that's going back to figure out, to help the brain figure out what that is. And again, here is the order, and you can see some of the regressions there. The circle represents words that are skipped. The brain simply creates this illusion of, smooth, of a smooth line in reading every word. It's this gestalt where the brain completes the picture from only partial information, just like your brain does there. So, what are we to conclude? We use what's in the head, along with semantics and syntax, to make predictions as we're reading. Predictions able, enable us to make sense of the semi-blurred letters in the peripheral regions. Efficient readers do not read letter by letter, word by word. They use minimal letter cues. And again, the brain tricks us into thinking we've looked at every letter and every word, but that's not the case. As teachers, we want beginning readers to read about familiar things using familiar language so that they can use what's in their head to help understand uh, what's on the page.